tense forms. Page 3. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Mum, come quickly. I've knocked over the ladder in the garden. I'm reading my book now, dear. Go and tell your father. He knows. He's been hanging from the roof for the past five minutes. Unit 1, page 7. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Where is little Johnny? Oh, he's gone to school. He's never been to school before. Mum, I'm home. Did you enjoy your first day? What? My first day? You mean I have to go back again tomorrow? Unit 1, page 8. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Johnny, where were you yesterday? You weren't at school. I was having a problem with influenza, sir. Oh, I didn't know you had been ill. Oh, no. I had been trying to spell it for so long that I was too tired to come to school. One, page 13. Listen and repeat, then act out. Dad, you'll be pleased when you hear my good news. What news? Well, you were going to give me five pounds for passing my exam. Yes, of course, son. I'll give it to you right now. Well, Dad, the good news is that you'll save some money. I failed! Unit 1, page 15. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Madam, I'm going to show you something amazing. Something you will never forget. Well, we'll see. I'm going to make a deal with you. If this electric cleaner doesn't pick up dust, I'll eat it. Well, I'll get you a knife and fork, because we don't have electricity here. Unit 2. Infinitive. Ing form. Participles. Ing. Ed. Adjectives. Page 21. Listen and repeat. Then act out. We believe in making our guests feel welcome. The best way to do this is to call them by their names. You can find out their names by reading their luggage labels. Very well, sir. I'll remember to do that. Ah, good afternoon, Mr. and Mrs. Cow's Leather. Unit 3. Modal Verbs. Page 33. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Mom, you must buy Grandma new glasses. Why should I? She can see very well. Look, she's watching Dad's boxer shorts in the washing machine. Oh, Mom, I ought to have told you. Grandma thinks she's watching the wrestling on TV. Unit 3, page 40. Listen and repeat. 
Then act out. Waiter, you shouldn't have served my soup with a dead fly in it. Don't stare at me like that. Say something. How sad, sir. That fly was too young to die. Progress check one, exercise four, page forty-eight. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer: A, B, or C. One. You hear a woman talking. Why did she leave her job? A. She was fired. B. She found a new position. C. She wanted to spend time with her children. I'd been working in that company for ten years, so to say that I needed a change would be an understatement. I always knew I would leave eventually. I just didn't know how. At one stage, I even thought they were going to give me the sack. I had come in late one too many mornings, but a harsh warning later, and I was back at my desk for another few years. Then, early last year, I read an advertisement for a secretarial post working from home. It would have been nice to have done this when the kids were growing up, but at least I don't have to worry about arriving late at work now. Two. You hear a man talking. What is his profession? A. An animal trainer. B. A magician. C. A driver. In my day, it was every young boy's dream to join a circus. In fact, as a teenager, I used to perform tricks to my friends, and I even played around with the idea of taking up magic as a career. Looking back now, there was no way I could have competed with the magicians we have today, but. At least I'm involved somewhat in the running of the circus, and it's not just about getting a lorry from A to B. I get to talk to the performers, and even spend time with the animals from time to time. Though, of course, I leave the feeding and handling to the experts. Three. You hear a witness being interviewed by police at a crime scene. What type of crime is being described? A. A robbery. B. Burglary. C. Speeding. Did you get a good look at the license plate, sir? I'm afraid not. It was too dark. Like I said, the hooded man jumped in, and they sped away past the bank. They were out of sight in no time. I see. And do you know the family personally? Not really, but I'd pass here most days while walking my dog. To be honest, it was obvious they were going away for the summer. I guess someone must have spotted that and thought, easy job. Four. You hear a teacher talking to a student. Why is she talking to her? A. To give advice. B. To give permission. C. To warn her. I'm afraid you have to stay until you have finished all the exercises, Lisa. You know very well that I can only give you permission to leave early if you bring me a note from your parents. And anyway, you need to be putting in all the hours you can right now. 
I don't need to remind you that you have to get good marks to get into university. Don't get me wrong. I know the tournament is important to you, but at this crucial stage of the year, you had better put your studies first and tennis second. Believe me, you'll be sorry if you don't. Five. You hear a musician talking. How does she feel when she's performing? A. Nervous. B. Relaxed. C. Confident. Over the years, I've performed to audiences of more than ten thousand people, in some of the most spectacular venues in the world. People assume that you get used to it, that you become more self-assured as the years pass. But as most musicians will tell you, that's rarely the case. I'm usually a bundle of nerves in the hours before a performance. Actually, it's often a relief to get on stage and play the first note. My body takes over, and only then can I feel a sense of calmness. Almost like I'm just another member of the audience listening along to the beautiful music. Six. You hear a music producer talking about internet piracy. How does he think the problem should be tackled? A. Impose fines on illegal downloaders. B. Lower the cost of CDs. C. Offer customers a new kind of product. In the U.S., some individuals have been forced to pay heavy fines to music companies for illegal downloading, and rightly so. If you break the law, you have to pay the price. But. I can't see music companies gaining much from going down this route. Illegal downloading is so widespread that it's almost beyond the reach of the law now. In my opinion, we've got to change the type of product we are selling to customers. Something that can't be copied and shared over the internet. For example, we could sell CDs with a T-shirt or a poster. But there's certainly no point in bringing half the teenagers of the country to court. Seven. You hear a dancer being interviewed on the radio. Why did he become a dancer? A. He wanted to please his mother. B. He followed his father's advice. C. He was inspired by a performance he saw. When did you discover your talent for dancing? I have always loved dancing, ever since I saw an amateur production of West Side Story in the local town hall. After that, I became single-minded about becoming a dancer, and no one was going to tell me it wasn't possible. Did you have the support of your family to make a career of it? For years, my mother used to plead with me to go to university and find a regular, steady job. My father was fine with it, though. When I asked him about going to dance college, he accepted my decision and backed me all the way. Eight. You hear part of a talk on text messaging. What is the speaker's argument? A. Text messaging is affecting students' schoolwork. B. Text messaging is becoming more popular than phoning. C. Text messaging is changing the way teens communicate. Since the late nineties, text messaging has swept across the world, and shows no signs of losing popularity. It does, however, have its opponents. For years, academics have been concerned about texting language and how it can affect students' spelling and grammar. 
Few, however, have considered the social consequences of texting. Some teens now prefer texting to calling, regardless of cost, because they're used to the social distance of the text message. Texting discourages direct human contact, and this is something we may need to start worrying about. That is the end of part one. Unit four: adjectives, adverbs, comparisons. Page forty-nine. Listen and repeat. Then act out. What's your new baby like? Oh, he's the best baby in the world. He's as good as gold. He's better than any other baby I've seen. I'm a very lucky man. It's amazing. He looks just like me. Never mind. As long as he's healthy. Unit four, page fifty-two. Listen and repeat. Then act out. My grandmother's ninety, and she hasn't a grey hair on her head. That's extremely rare. Well, not really. She's as bald as a billiard ball. Unit four, page fifty-seven. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Doctor, I have a big problem. I have three expensive cars. My children go to the best schools. My wife buys the most expensive clothes. Generally, we live better than royalty. So, what exactly is the problem? I only earn fifty pounds a week. Unit four, page sixty-six. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Tom's wife is just like the Mona Lisa. Do you mean she's as beautiful as that? No, I mean she ought to be in a museum. Unit five, clauses, linking words, page seventy-one. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Billy, you're very late for school. I won't let you attend the class until you give me a good excuse. I'm sorry, Miss. I was banging in some nails when I hurt two fingers. But I can't see any bandages. Well, they weren't my fingers. Unit five, page seventy-eight. Listen and repeat. Then act out. This is such a small diamond that I can't even see it. That's right, darling. It's so small that the glare won't hurt your eyes. Unit five. Page eighty-two. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Have you made the breakfast yet? Not quite. Even though I've been boiling the eggs for fifteen minutes, they're still hard. Unit five, page eighty-five. Listen and repeat. Then act out. You look as if you've lived through a famine. 
And you look as if you caused it. Unit 5, page 87. Listen and repeat, then act out. Could we have a bag to take my daughter's leftovers home to the dog, please? Oh, Dad, how kind of you. What a wonderful surprise. Are we getting a dog then? Unit 5, page 89. Listen and repeat, then act out. Today, I saw a baby who had put on seven kilos in two weeks by drinking elephant's milk. Do you know whose baby it was? Yes, the elephant's. Unit 6. Passive voice. Corsative form. Page 102. Listen and repeat, then act out. Have all your cakes been sold? There's one left. It was freshly baked this morning. It looks as though it has been eaten by mice. Oh, that's impossible, madam. The cat's been lying on it all morning. Unit 6, page 114. Listen and repeat, then act out. I'm having my leg operated on tomorrow. I'm afraid I might have it put in a plaster cast for a few weeks. Oh, good. Can I borrow your car, then? You won't be needing it. Progress Check 2, Exercise 4, page 121. You'll hear an interview with a man called Michael Frank, who runs a museum. For questions 1 to 10, Complete the sentences. You now have 45 seconds to look at part two. For many of us, there is nothing more relaxing than admiring beautiful works of art in a museum or gallery. Far fewer people would choose to spend a day looking at bad art. Michael Frank, the founder of the Museum of Bad Art in Boston, hopes to change our minds. Michael, welcome to the show. Hello. How did you come up with the idea for a museum of bad art? Well, one morning I spotted a painting in a rubbish bin outside my home. At that time I was an antique dealer, so I was always on the lookout for nice pieces of art. That painting, however, was awful. But Lucy in the Field with Flowers, as I have since called it, inspired me to open the museum. <laughs> How did you go about collecting the other pieces of bad art in the museum? Hmm. All in all, it took about a year and a half to gather the collection. My co-founder, Louise Riley, and I looked in dustbins, charity shops, 
and dusty attics all over the USA. We even had some paintings sent to us from Japan. By 1994, we had gathered the biggest collection of bad art in the world. And how did you decide on a location for the museum?、Hmm. At first, we looked for a location in Boston City Center, but we soon realized we couldn't afford the rent we were being asked. In fact, we had very little money. So eventually, I found a cheap space in the basement of a cinema in the Dedham suburb of South Boston. We held our first exhibition there in March 1995. I see, but what exactly is bad art? For example, will you find drawings from five-year-olds in the museum? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you won't find kids' fridge drawings or ugly images from advertisements or travel brochures. Basically, all of the pieces on display in the museum. Were created by adults or teenagers who were seriously trying to make art. The problem is, most of us can't paint or draw very well. So, most of the artists on show are people who had far more emotion than they had skill. Okay. And what are visitors' reactions when they walk around the museum? Do you get a lot of people laughing at what they see? Surprisingly, very few do, and we don't encourage it either. I think that a lot of our visitors relate to the artists on show. At some stage, we have all tried to write a poem or draw a picture and failed terribly, but that doesn't mean we didn't have the same emotions that the great artists felt. That's why I opened the museum, to celebrate artistic people who could never be artists. And has the museum been a success? I think so. We only get around 120 visitors to the museum a week, but our web page, which displays a selection of our collection, has become very popular. We receive around 20,000 hits a month. We've also brought out a book with pictures of seventy of the museum's more popular works, along with reviews written by me of each picture. I'm sure a lot of our listeners will be interested in paying your museum a visit soon, Michael. Is there an entrance fee? Admission is three dollars for adults, and it's free for students.、Ah. Thanks for coming in, Michael. My pleasure. Now you'll hear part two again. For many of us, there is nothing more relaxing than admiring beautiful works of art in a museum or gallery. Far fewer people would choose to spend a day looking at bad art. Michael Frank, the founder of the Museum of Bad Art in Boston, hopes to change our minds. Michael, welcome to the show. Hello. How did you come up with the idea for a museum of bad art? Well, one morning I spotted a painting in a rubbish bin outside my home. At that time, I was an antique dealer, so I was always on the lookout for nice pieces of art. That painting, however, was awful. But Lucy in the field with flowers, as I have since called it. Inspired me to open the museum. <laughs> How did you go about collecting the other pieces of bad art in the museum?、Hmm. All in all, it took about a year and a half to gather the collection. My co-founder Louise Riley and I looked in dustbins, charity shops, and dusty attics all over the USA. We even had some paintings sent to us from Japan. By 1994, we.
we had gathered the biggest collection of bad art in the world. And how did you decide on a location for the museum?、Hmm. At first, we looked for a location in Boston City Center, but we soon realized we couldn't afford the rent we were being asked. In fact, we had very little money. So eventually, I found a cheap space in the basement of a cinema, in the Dedham suburb of South Boston. We held our first exhibition there in March 1995. I see. But what exactly is bad art? For example, will you find drawings from five-year-olds in the museum? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> You won't find kids' fridge drawings or ugly images from advertisements or travel brochures. Basically, all of the pieces on display in the museum were created by adults or teenagers who were seriously trying to make art. The problem is, most of us can't paint or draw very well, <laughs> so. Most of the artists on show are people who had far more emotion than they had skill. Okay. And what are visitors' reactions when they walk around the museum? Do you get a lot of people laughing at what they see? Surprisingly, very few do, and we don't encourage it either. I think that a lot of our visitors relate to the artists on show. At some stage, we have all tried to write a poem or draw a picture and failed terribly. But that doesn't mean we didn't have the same emotions that the great artists felt. That's why I opened the museum to celebrate artistic people who could never be artists. And has the museum been a success? I think so. We only get around 120 visitors to the museum a week, but our web page, which displays a selection of our collection, has become very popular. We receive around 20,000 hits a month. We've also brought out a book with pictures of 70 of the museum's more popular works, along with reviews <laughs> written by me of each picture. I'm sure a lot of our listeners will be interested in paying your museum a visit soon, Michael. Is there an entrance fee? Admission is three dollars for adults, and it's free for students.、Ah. Thanks for coming in, Michael. My pleasure. That is the end of part two. Unit Seven, Reported Speech, Page One Hundred and Twenty-Two. Listen and repeat, then act out. I'm going to play football for my school team. I love football. You're going to play tennis. You told me that you loved football. You said you were going to play for the school team. Yes, I did. But after I let in the seventh goal, the team didn't like me. Unit eight, conditionals, wishes, unreal past, page one hundred and forty. Listen and repeat, then act out. I wish I could lose some weight. If you exercised more, you would lose weight. How about golf? Oh, that's no good. If I put the ball where I can hit it, I can't see it. And if I put it where I can see it, I can't hit it. Unit Eight, Page One Hundred and Forty-Seven. Listen and repeat, then act out.
I wish I were rich. I wish I had enough money to buy a lot of food. I wish I hadn't put on so much weight. I wish I could go on a diet. Could you give me some money, please? I haven't eaten anything for three days. If only I had your willpower. Unit eight, page one hundred and fifty. Listen and repeat. Then act out. If I married your daughter, I would make her very happy, sir. Supposing she were poor, would you still want to marry her? But of course, sir. Then I'd rather you didn't marry her. I don't want a fool in the family. Unit nine, nouns, word formation, articles, page one hundred and fifty-six. Listen and repeat, then act out. Paul, why did Grandma send you out of the kitchen? Did you say something about her food? She doesn't like my sense of humour. She asked me what the best things to put in a fruit cake were. What did you say? My teeth. Unit nine. Page one hundred and sixty-four. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Mummy, there's a black cat in the kitchen. That's all right, dear. Black cats bring good luck. Not the black cat in our kitchen. It's just eaten the cake on the table. Progress check three, exercise four, page one hundred and seventy-four. You will hear five different people talking about their achievements. For questions one to five, choose from the list A to F what each person achieved. Use the letters only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You now have thirty seconds to look at part three. One. I couldn't believe it when I got the phone call. I was sure the interview hadn't gone well, and that my qualifications weren't good enough. One of the candidates I met outside had a diploma in economics and could speak French. So, I was surprised when I heard the good news. I felt like I was wearing a medal around my neck. For the rest of the day, now I can't wait to get started. Who knows? This could be the first step towards great things for me. Two. I never imagined I would see my poems in print. After all, writing was just a hobby for me. I didn't even study English at university. It was just something I enjoyed doing for an hour or so after work, or at the weekends. It was my wife who first encouraged me to contact the publishing company. They told me to gather a collection of my best work and send it to them. <laughs> the rest is history. I don't expect it to win any awards, 
but I hope a few copies are sold. 3. I was so happy when I was handed the degree. I didn't come first in the class or anywhere near it, but I think I felt prouder than anyone else in the room. It's been a long four years, and to be honest, there were times when I didn't think I'd make it. I spent a lot of late nights writing essays and studying for exams. I'm just glad my family and my professors were there to help me through it. What next? Well, I hope to travel a little now. Maybe even learn a new language. I certainly want a few adventures before I start looking for a job. 4. I never even realised that I had a talent for spelling until my English teacher advised me to take part in the competition. She knew how much I loved reading and must have thought that I could do well. I'm so glad she did. It's been a wonderful experience. I'm not very good at sports, so I never imagined that I'd ever win a trophy. And next month, I'm going to the National Spelling Championships at Oxford University. I can't wait! 5. I started the classes around two years ago, and already I think I'm quite fluent. It was my sister who said I should take an evening class. I was happy at work, but I needed a new challenge in my life. At first, I thought about doing a business course. I'm so glad I changed my mind. It feels great to be able to go to a foreign country and speak to the locals in their own tongue. And if I ever do look for a new job, I'm happy that I'll be able to add something new to my CV. Now you'll hear part three again. One. I couldn't believe it when I got the phone call. I was sure the interview hadn't gone well and that my qualifications weren't good enough. One of the candidates I met outside had a diploma in economics and could speak French. So I was surprised when I heard the good news. I felt like I was wearing a medal around my neck for the rest of the day. Now, I can't wait to get started. Who knows? This could be the first step towards great things for me. 2. I never imagined I would see my poems in print. After all, writing was just a hobby for me. I didn't even study English at university. It was just something I enjoyed doing for an hour or so after work, or at the weekends. It was my wife who first encouraged me to contact the publishing company. They told me to gather a collection of my best work and send it to them. <laughs> the rest is history. I don't expect it to win any awards, but I hope a few copies are sold. 3. I was so happy when I was handed the degree. I didn't come first in the class or anywhere near it, but I think I felt prouder than anyone else in the room. It's been a long four years, and to be honest, there were times when I didn't think I'd make it. I spent a lot of late nights writing essays and studying for exams. I'm just glad my family and my professors were there to help me through it. What next? Well, I hope to travel a little now. Maybe even learn a new language. I certainly want a few adventures before I start looking for a job. 4. I never even realised that I had a talent for spelling until my English teacher advised me to take part in the competition. She knew how much I loved reading and must have thought that I could do well. I'm so glad she did. It's been a wonderful experience. I'm not very good at sports, so I never imagined that I'd ever win a trophy. And next month, I'm going to the National Spelling Championships at Oxford University. 
I can't wait. Five. I started the classes around two years ago, and already I think I'm quite fluent. It was my sister who said I should take an evening class. I was happy at work, but I needed a new challenge in my life. At first, I thought about doing a business course. I'm so glad I changed my mind. It feels great to be able to go to a foreign country and speak to the locals in their own tongue. And if I ever do look for a new job, I'm happy that I'll be able to add something new to my CV. That is the end of part three. Unit ten, emphasis, inversion, page one hundred and seventy-five. Listen and repeat, then act out. Who was it that painted my car red and green? It was me that did it. Well, um, I just wanted to say that not only does it look lovely. But it's also drying beautifully. Unit ten, page one hundred and seventy-eight. Listen and repeat, then act out. Last year, I opened a jewelry shop. Oh, really? Were you successful? Not really. No sooner had I opened the door than the police arrived. Unit eleven, pronouns, possessives, quantifiers, demonstratives. Page one hundred and eighty-four. Listen and repeat, then act out. How would you like your hair cut? Shall I cut it like your father's? Oh no, I don't want mine to look like his. His hair has got a hole on top. Unit eleven, page one hundred and eighty-seven. Listen and repeat, then act out. What's your baby's name? Caffeine. That's a strange name. Yes, you see, she keeps us awake all night. Unit eleven, page one hundred and ninety-one. Listen and repeat. Then act out. Is there anything I can do for you, sir? You gave me a year's guarantee with my car, and you said you'd mend everything that breaks. That's right, sir. Has anything broken? Yes, I need some new gates for my neighbours. Unit eleven, page one hundred and ninety-seven. Listen and repeat, then act out. None of the cars I've seen are painted that way. Why is yours painted a different colour on each side? Well, if I have an accident, the witnesses will spend all their time contradicting each other. Unit eleven, page two hundred. Listen and repeat, then act out. Johnny, if I gave you a pound and your father gave you another pound, how many pounds would you have? One pound, sir. You don't study much, Johnny, do you? You haven't met my father, sir. 
have you? Unit 12. Questions. Short answers. Page 209. Listen and repeat, then act out. Do you want to come to my party? Yes, I do. What's the address? 25 Broad Street. Just press the bell with your elbow. Why should I press the bell with my elbow? Well, you'll be carrying my present, won't you? Unit 12, page 216. Listen and repeat, then act out. Do you like my ring? Yes, I do. Your fiancé is tall and dark, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's got blue eyes, hasn't he? Yes, he has. He drives a red car, doesn't he? Yes, he does. It's amazing. You know all that just by looking at my ring. Well, it's the one I gave back to him a month ago. Progress Check 4 Exercise 4 Page 226 you will hear a magician being interviewed on a radio program. Choose the correct answer, A, B or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. I'm joined now by the American magician David McBride. David is currently touring the country with his show The Great Escaper, in which he performs the stunts of the famous escape artist Harry Houdini. David also released a biography about Houdini last January. David, could you start by telling us a little about Houdini's early life? He was born in Europe, wasn't he? Yes, that's right. Although he claimed to have been born in America in many of his books, Houdini was actually born in Budapest, Hungary, in 1874. And his real name wasn't Houdini, I imagine. No, he was born Eric Weiss. The Weiss family moved to America when Eric was four and settled in New York City. And how did Eric become interested in performing? Well, as a teenager, he came across the autobiography of the French magician Jean-Robert Houdin. Young Eric was so fascinated by the book that he chose the stage name Houdini in honor of his hero and decided to become a professional magician. And did he immediately concentrate on escape acts? Not immediately, but it wasn't long before he discovered his talent for escaping. He became internationally popular in 1900 when he toured Europe as the Handcuff King. 
He went around the continent asking local policemen to handcuff him and lock him in their jails to see if he could escape. Of course, he always did. So things never went wrong. Well, there were some narrow escapes. On one occasion in London, a special set of handcuffs that took seven years to make was put on Houdini. Houdini was clearly having great difficulty escaping from these. Many hours had passed, and the audience began to wonder if Houdini had failed. Then his wife Bess went on stage and gave him a kiss. An hour later, Houdini had broken free, but many people now think that Bess kissed Houdini with the key for the handcuffs. In her mouth, but it wasn't only handcuffs or prison cells that Houdini could escape from. Houdini performed a huge number of different stunts, many of which seem very dangerous. Do you include these stunts in your show?、Mm, generally, no. Many of Houdini's escape stunts depended on him putting his body at risk of injury. For example. Houdini often had to dislocate his shoulders and wrists, or cough up small keys from his stomach. I would be willing to try these stunts, but the problem is I don't have the same body type as Houdini. He had incredible strength and flexibility that allowed him to do stunts that most people, including me, would find impossible. So. I perform the stunts that aren't so extreme, but which I still hope are very entertaining. So, what can we see at your show then? Well, the show is kind of like a biography on stage. I perform the stunts in the order that Houdini performed them during his career. I think each stunt gets more and more exciting for the audience. It really shows how Houdini developed as a performer throughout his life. David, it's been fascinating to talk to you, but before you leave, I should tell you we've had lots of people phoning in asking where they can buy tickets for your show. Well, my Manchester shows are sold out, but you can purchase tickets online for my shows in the Gate Theatre in London. Now you'll hear part four again. I'm joined now by the American magician David McBride. David is currently touring the country with his show *The Great Escaper*, in which he performs the stunts of the famous escape artist Harry Houdini. David also released a biography about Houdini last January. David. Could you start by telling us a little about Houdini's early life? He was born in Europe, wasn't he? Yes, that's right. Although he claimed to have been born in America in many of his books, Houdini was actually born in Budapest, Hungary, in 1874. And his real name wasn't Houdini, I imagine. No, he was born Eric Weiss. The Weiss family moved to America when Eric was four and settled in New York City. And how did Eric become interested in performing? Well, as a teenager, he came across the autobiography of the French magician Jean Robert Houdin. Young Eric was so fascinated by the book that he chose the stage name Houdini in honor of his hero, and decided to become a professional magician. And did he immediately concentrate on escape acts? Not immediately, but it wasn't long before he discovered his talent for escaping. He became internationally popular in 1900 when he toured Europe as the Handcuff King. He went around the continent asking local policemen to handcuff him and lock him in their jails to see if he could escape.
Of course, <laughs> he always did. So things never went wrong. Well, there were some narrow escapes. On one occasion in London, a special set of handcuffs that took seven years to make was put on Houdini. Houdini was clearly having great difficulty escaping from these. Many hours had passed, and the audience began to wonder if Houdini had failed. Then his wife Bess went on stage and gave him a kiss. An hour later, Houdini had broken free. But many people now think that Bess kissed Houdini with the key for the handcuffs. In her mouth, but it wasn't only handcuffs or prison cells that Houdini could escape from. Houdini performed a huge number of different stunts, many of which seem very dangerous. Do you include these stunts in your show?、Mm, generally, no. Many of Houdini's escape stunts depended on him putting his body at risk of injury. For example. Houdini often had to dislocate his shoulders and wrists, or cough up small keys from his stomach. I would be willing to try these stunts, but the problem is I don't have the same body type as Houdini. He had incredible strength and flexibility that allowed him to do stunts that most people, including me, would find impossible. So. I perform the stunts that aren't so extreme, but which I still hope are very entertaining. So, what can we see at your show then? Well, the show is kind of like a biography on stage. I perform the stunts in the order that Houdini performed them during his career. I think each stunt gets more and more exciting for the audience. It really shows how Houdini developed as a performer throughout his life. David, it's been fascinating to talk to you, but before you leave, I should tell you we've had lots of people phoning in asking where they can buy tickets for your show. Well, my Manchester shows are sold out, but you can purchase tickets online for my shows in the Gate Theatre in London. That is the end of part four. Thanks for watching.